Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to today's uh, seminar talk. So today we have Andy Jenkins from UGA uh, to talk about the nilpotent cone for Lie super algebras. Okay, so uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, so yeah, so today I'd like to uh, share with you what I've been working on with uh, Dr. Nakano for the past, I don't know, year or so. and. Uh, and uh, the talk today is going to be about uh, this construction of what's called the nilpotent cone, uh, but it's an analog for Lie super algebras. And so I tried to make the talk um, semi-interactive since we're virtual. So I, I'll uh, fill in and write some things as we go along and we'll see, uh, see how that goes. But let me know if you can't see anything on the slides um, since, it's, uh, since it's a new kind of software. Okay, so the outline for today is I'd like to um, kind of talk about the motivation um, for why we defined the nilpotent cone for Lie super algebras the way we did by considering the ordinary nilpotent cone and just reviewing some of the properties and uses that it has. Um, and then go into the construction of the nilpotent cone for, uh, for Lie super algebras that we have and look at some of its properties. Um, let's see here. Oh, oh no. Let's see, did it decide at this exact moment? There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about the properties of the nilpotent cone that we define for Lie super algebras. Um, specifically, we'll show finiteness. of the orbits. And this will be under uh, the G action that we'll see later. And then I'd like to explain some of the connections um, that, that our construction has with this other object called the deflow Serganova commuting variety that they defined back in 2005. And see kind of uh, how, they're, how they're connected and how they can be used for super representation here. Okay. And so just a couple of uh, conventions. So everything's gonna be over C today. Um, and G will almost always uh, just for simplicity be a connected reductive algebraic group um, with its corresponding Lie algebra math group G here. Okay. So first just the, the definition of the nilpotent cone that uh, I think most of us have seen before is that we can define it as just being the set of all the nilpotent elements of a given Lie algebra G. And we know lots of um, interesting sort of geometric properties that have been studied about the nilpotent cone. So for example, I just listed a few of the common ones here um, that, that are some useful geometric properties. Uh, so we know it's an irreducible subvariety of the Lie algebra G. We actually know its dimension. Um, and it'll be two times the dimension of a maximal unipotent subalgebra. And then what will be important for us today is that um, because uh, the nilpotent cone is stable under the adjoint action of the algebraic group G here, um, then we'll, we'll have that we can decompose in as a union of nilpotent orbits. So these are just orbits um, of nilpotents. Okay. Um, and so one other basic fact um, or sort of an example is that uh, for what we'll be considering, if you just if you just think of um, our, our Lie algebras as being a linear Lie algebra so that it, it embeds into uh, to some GLN, then we actually know what the adjoint action is. And it's just given by the usual conjugation of, of matrices, right? Because then we can write X out as a matrix in terms of the basis. And so then the conjugation action is is just uh, the usual matrix conjugation. And so in that case, the orbits um, in particular are just similarity classes of matrices. And if we add the word nilpotent here, like what we're considering, then our similarity classes we could take as a representative, uh, we could take a Jordan form, a matrix in Jordan form, uh, up to some permutation of the blocks, and it'll have uh, all eigenvalues. Zero. 
Okay. So uh, as I was saying, so beforehand, we don't know that, that this union is necessarily uh, finite, but it's uh, a classical result um, that, that it is, <laughs> that it does decompose that way when you have a connected reductive algebraic group. So then the number of uh, G orbits on, on your null photon cone is actually finite. And let me um, go ahead and scroll down to the next slide here. So, you know, there's, there's been several uh, sort of classical ways that are interesting in their own right for, for how to prove this. So um, one way that I've seen is the Dinkin Kostnick classification. And so here they use some special uh, weighted Dinkin diagrams. Um, and SL2 triples also show up. Um, and then there's there's another sort of uh, fun way to, to prove this, which is using partitions. Uh, for the classical types, so for types uh, A through D. And then you could use um, this other theory called the uh, Bala Carter theory for the exceptionals. So that's just a couple of the ways that I know of that uh, that's been proven. But anyway, so it's it's a well-known result. Um, and and later, what we'll see is for our construction for the no potent cone, um, we will generalize this result in a, in a different way. And what will be useful later is this other characterization um, of the no potent cone in terms of invariants. So uh, so this is. viewing in in terms of invariance. Oops. So in this case, if we take um, some G that's connected reductive inside of GLV here, then we can realize the nope potent cone as um, this zero locus of these particular invariants. So we look at the G invariants um, here that have zero constant term, which is what the plus means. Um, and we look at the symmetric algebra on G star, and then look at the G invariance with zero constant. And that zero locus turns out to be the no potent cone. Okay, and more explicitly, I have written here uh, how, how you could think of that, right? So it would have to, it would be the elements that evaluate to zero for every polynomial in this algebra here. Okay. And then I don't want to say uh, too much about this, but I just wanted to list in case anyone's interested. Um, you know, there's there's a lot more applications of, that have been studied with the nilpotent cone. And so here's just a very broad overview of that. So people have studied the orbit and centralizer structure of the nilpotent orbits and their corresponding centralizers. You actually have a nice uh, sort of post-up relation between the orbit closures um, that can give you some more information about how they're all related. There's this nice, uh, resolution of singularities here called the Springer resolution. Um, and then there's and there's a, a way that Springer developed his correspondence and geometric representation theory um, between some uh, wild group representations and uh, nil foot orbits um, and, and a, in a way that uh, I would like to understand better. Okay, so now I want to move on to, to least super algebras. So first, let's just uh, define what those are. So we have a, a least super algebra G is this direct sum of these two components, G0 and G1 here. And so we think of G0 as being somehow even elements and G1 as being odd elements, because what we've done is we've put a Z mod 2 Z grading on the algebra, and it comes with an associated bilinear oper operation here that generalizes the bracket. And so it needs to satisfy a couple of axioms. So, so first, we should respect the grading. So really, I should have bars over all these, but um, I'm sure I got lazy and stopped writing the bars. But, um, 
So first we should have that it respects the grading, which is what this first condition is saying. Then we should have an analog of anti-commutativity where we have to consider um, we have to consider the, the degrees of the corresponding elements. So here, uh, this absolute value of, of an element uh, that's either zero or one, depending on which part it lives in. Um, and so this, I should have said, so this is sort of implied, but these axioms are for uh, for, homoge for homogeneous elements. Oops. All right, so these are for homogeneous elements, and then you can extend by linearity to see how this would work for an arbitrary element. Um, and then last we have, here we have an analog of the Jacobi identity. Oops. Okay. Um, what else do I want to say? So for all the least super algebras we consider today, we can just uh, go ahead and, and pretend that our bracket is just uh, the usual commutator, but and, but uh, super superfied. All right, so we would have x y minus y x, but instead we introduce a sign based off the uh, based off the parity of the elements. But uh, we'll be using that that bracket today for uh, for linear these super algebras. Um, and so you, you can already see you get some some interesting extra structure here by by putting this grading on G. So first off, notice uh, I didn't write it here, but notice it, that it really does generalize Lie algebras in the sense that if you just look at G zero itself, so G zero is an ordinary Lie algebra. If you just restrict the bracket down and you go back through these axioms, you see that you just recover the ordinary Lie algebra axioms. Um, but then we also have this other interesting fact here that we can look at the odd part of the Lie algebra and it'll, uh, the Lie super algebra, and it will always be a G zero module when we use the adjoint action. So you could think of it as either little G zero or equivalently capital G zero. And so here the adjoint action is, is slightly different than in the ordinary case. So now this adjoint action should be a map not from all of G, but from just G zero. And it doesn't go into endomorphisms on all of G, but just on G one. And then you send an element of G zero to a bracket with itself, bracket with X. Okay. So a nice, easy first example of these uh, the least super algebra is uh, GLMN, which just generalizes the uh, gen general linear Lie algebra. So if you write out a matrix representation of this, the, the elements in here consist of M plus N by M plus N matrices. And so they would be able to be put into this block form where here A would be M by N, B would be M by N, C would be N by M, and uh, D would be N by N. And so then we can see from just this matrix representation that uh, if you look at just the um, even part here, so maybe we'll use, this would be the even part. So here's our even part. And so in this case, we can see that we just have a direct sum of GLM and GLN, that's the even part. And so then the corresponding algebraic group is also capital GLM cross GLM. And so then in this case, we can um, define what the adjoint action should be here. And so it's again conjugation, but now it's a little, a little bit different because we're taking something that's um, here, this is N 
capital G zero here, right? And then it acts on this element of G one in this way, where we conjugate. So it is matrix conjugation, but it's sort of interesting because now like up here, you know, these, these don't match anymore. So you get something extra going on. Okay. So we also have a, a classification uh, similar to the classification for Lie algebras, for simple Lie algebras. Um, so we'll be considering uh, classical uh, simple Lie algebras. So uh, all that means is that the G0, so the algebraic group corresponding to uh, corresponding to the even part of the Lie super algebra, we want it to be connected reductive. Because when we have that, since G1 is a, is a finite dimensional um, uh, G0 module, will be completely reduced. And if we have that, then we say that uh, the Lie super algebra is classical. And so here's a list of all of those. Um, so these, the reason simple here is in quotes is that these aren't simple in the true sense. So some of these aren't simple, but um, I believe uh, in, in uh, uh, some of the papers from Bo, Kujawa, and Nakano, they, they decided that uh, simple here should include things that are close to simple. So uh, that, that's why we have a few extra things on this list. For example, uh, of course, GLMN is not going to be simple but it's close and we can, all the proofs will carry over. So we include it anyway. Um, but for Lee Super Rogers, there's also some, there's also some interesting cases where like you get some new, some new sort of symbols like uh, PSL and N here. So this comes from the fact that SL and N is actually not simple in the true sense. Um, because if you look, it has a, a non-trivial sub-algebra generated by the identity. But if you quotient out by that, you get this PSLNN, it is simple, but we just include them both. Um, and then OSPs here, so you can think of these as being uh, somehow analogs of types A, uh, types B through D. So here the, the O part would somehow be a, a, a special, uh, an SO, right? And the SP part would be an SP, so type C. Um, then we also have some exceptionals. So G3 and F4. And then D21 alpha is sort of interesting. So alpha here is just some parameter and C. Um, and so this is actually an infinite, infinite family. Um, of some exceptional Lee super algebras. And then there's some new types down here that are called strange, types Q and P, and PSQ is defined in a similar way by quotient out uh, as PSL. And then there's some other types in the classification that we won't consider uh, that are called parton types. I think uh, if I remember correctly, this is like four more infinite families that I won't be considering. All right. So with that out of the way, uh, here's here's our uh, our new definition for the nil potent cone in uh, early super algebras. Here. So notice that similar to the way uh, that you can interpret n in terms of invariance for the ordinary Lie algebras, except we've replaced g by g one here, and we've replaced um, g by g zero because now. Uh, this is, I mean, this is how the adjoint actually works now. So you have G0 acting on G1 instead of G acting on G. But otherwise, it's the same sort of idea where we take the zero locus of the G0 invariant polynomials with zero constant term um, and SG1 star. Uh, and, then, and then that's how we can define it in terms of these invariants. Let's see if there's anything else I want to say about that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I want to mention two sort of related ideas of why um, why this might seem like a good way to define it. So first, um, it turns out that 
uh, Katz back in 1980, he defined this object called uh, nil varieties, but it was more general where he was looking at Z-graded uh, Lie algebra, so not just Z mod 2 Z-graded. Um, but, but he did something similar where he looked at the zero locus of some invariants, um, but more, more relevant to our work is that there was this uh, series of papers by uh, Bo Kajawa and Nakano, specifically the first one, uh, I believe was in 2006, um, where they defined these detecting subalgebras. And this was defined using semi-simple elements, which I maybe should put in quotes, but um, they, they defined the notion of semi-simple. Um, and with that, they defined these two other subalgebras, E and F, um, that they called detecting subalgebras. And so this is because in some sense, uh, they detect some cohomology. Um, and in this setup, they found that the restriction maps induce isomorphisms in this following diagram here. So notice here's, here's RS of G1 star G0 invariants. And then they have these two, uh, two invariant algebras that were constructed um, using semi-simple elements. And so in, in some ways, this reminds you of the setup um, like in the ordinary Lie algebras where we have the Chevalier restriction theorem. Uh, right, where we have, uh, we look at the G star, G invariance, and we restrict down to looking at a maximum torus, um, and we should have uh, the Wilkert invariance here. All right, so, so this sort of picture looks similar because these, this F and E should be playing the role of your maximum torus in some sense, your semi simple parts. Um, and then it, it, it seems convenient that you have this over here that can maybe play the role of nil focus. So that was uh, part of the motivation for how we defined this. Um, I don't know how much I want to say about this diagram. Maybe I'll just say that, um, you know, this, this is a, another reductive group that they defined. Um, and this is a, a finite pseudo reflection group. Um, yes, but they have this, they have this nice setup where they can construct these detecting subalgebra in this, in this way. So that sort of motivated our definition. Okay. So first, now that we've defined it, you would hope that if it's a good definition, it would at least generalize the ordinary nil problem. Well. And so good news, it does. Um, and here's how that, here's how that works. So if we just take uh, A to be an ordinary Lie algebra, we can construct the least super algebra in this sort of way where we just make both the even and the odd parts be A. And then we can define our super bracket by just letting it be the ordinary Lie bracket on G0. Um, it'll be the adjoint action when we're letting G0 bracket G1 and just make it trivial on G1. So if you check, then that will define the super bracket. And then if we look at G0 here, uh, capital G0, if it's the corresponding uh, algebraic group for little g0, then we'll recover the ordinary nil potent term. Right, and you can see that from looking at um, our definition again. It's a zero locus here. But um, in this case, Lee of g0 being g0 is also A. So this uh, G0 is also just, uh, maybe just call it G, uh, oops. Where um, Lee of G is A, and then G1 is also A. So if we put that in here, Right, this looks like the uh, the ordinary no protocol. Yeah. 
you the training group. Okay. I'm just, I'm just remarking. I'm just, I'm just a remark. Okay. I, 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 <laughs> so, so do you want to repeat that so I can tell the people at home? Oh, I was just going to say, if A, you could do this with instead of D1 equals A, you have D1 equals A representation. Right. So, so Dr. Graham wants to know that um, you could actually replace here, you could replace G1, not just by A, but by uh, any, any any G0 representation and this would this construction would still work. So there's nothing special about taking just G1 to BA necessarily. Right. Okay. All right. So now with the setup all here, uh, here's here's our first new result. Um, so if we just consider GLMN, um, uh, we were able to show that the number of G0 orbits via the adjoint action on N was finite. And um, the way that we did that is we actually um, determined what the orbit represented should be and saw that, that the parameters that define them are actually finite. So uh, here's just the statement, and then I'm going to talk more about the structure of this block matrix down here in just a second on the next slide. But uh, so the, the idea is that um, we just split up the grading further into a, a positive and a negative part. Um, and then what we did is we we looked, um, we, we basically sort of went step by step algorithmically through different blocks to see what kind of conjugations we could do and what kind of forms we could get out for our representative. And then um, as we move block by block, we attempted to centralize the previous steps, okay? And just, just kept going um, one block at a time. So let me say more about what these representatives are. Okay. So um, some of the notation I think should be pretty self-explanatory. So here IR and IS that are showing up, these are um, respective R by R or S by S identity matrices. Um, so if we call this entire block here, we call this J. And then J is the uh, Jordan form. Um, with zero eigenvalues. So each of these Ji is a is a, a Jordan block of size uh, size Ki. Maybe this should really be instead of J1 through JT, this should be like JK1 through JKT to indicate the size. Um, so I guess I can make that. So Ji is a Jordan block of size Ki, and we also note that um, the size of these blocks corresponds between Y plus and Y minus. So that means that this block J should correspond to IR. So the sum of these um, sizes KI is, uh, is R. So this is a, a, an R by R matrix up here. So this is R, R, and uh, this should be R by R. Okay, and then what are these other, these last two pieces here? So this C and this R, uh, are either column or row echelon forms um, almost. So CR1 is in column echelon form. Um, and its rank is this R1. So that's what it's denoting is the rank there. Um, but it's also almost in row echelon form. Um, it's in the row echelon form up to a, a, a permutation of the rows. So um, I should say that there's one representative that is in row echelon form, but the others might have some zero rows uh, uh, 
that are not all at the bottom. Okay, so it's, it's I'll just call it almost real echelon form. And then R, R2 is somewhere. Okay, so that's what that's what these guys look like. Um, I guess I could say, I meant to say one more thing. Um, if I want to be a little more specific or precise about what CR1 looks like. So if you think in terms of unit vectors here, it's really some E I1 up to E I R1. Where these are these are unit vectors. Okay, but there's there's some zero rows in between, which is why I said it's uh, in general it's not in row echelon form because of that. Okay, so the zeros and ones, right? Yes, everywhere. Yeah. And uh, what are the bars? Horizontal and vertical bars. That's just to indicate, uh, like you mean for C and R. Yes. So in the, yeah. So what's what's about CR1? So so Arik wanted to point out um, first that uh, every every entry in sight in these matrices is either zero or one, and then the question was what do these bars represent for CR1 and RR2? That's just to indicate that um, that this CR1 is this entire sort of block column here. So this is like size R by R1. Okay. Yes. So it's not that you have more of these types of matrices stacked on top. So they, I mean, this whole column. That's right. There's one C copy. Okay, yeah. 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 So the C, so the lines for the CR1 don't represent that there's uh, multiple copies of this kind of matrix. There's exactly one, and it just fills this entire column, entire block of columns. Andy. Yes. This is Brian. Can R1 be more or less anything from zero up to n minus r? Um, so that's a good question. So actually, actually, no, we, we know a little bit more um, about what uh, the size of these can be. So in fact, you can, you can only have non-zero entries in rows that correspond to the last row of the Jordan blocks. So what I mean is um, the only place that these EIJs could occur for the C are in rows K1, K1 plus K2, K1 plus K2 plus K3, and so on. So, that so you can have at most T of those right. columns there. Right. And if, and if your Jordan blocks were all trivial, it could be at most R. So that's the largest size it could be. Thanks. OK. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm doing OK. I have, I have until 4.50. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so since, let's see, I've got that much time left. So let me just um, say really briefly, maybe even just the, the first step of how this goes. I didn't, I didn't want to go through this in detail, but I just wanted to show like one sample calculation that we would do here. So I mentioned this earlier that the idea is to use a sequence of conjugations um, using the adjoint action. We just keep track of the centralizing conditions we need at each step. So for example, if we look at Y plus, um, when we act with our pair A and B, that's in G zero here. So this is GLM cross GLM. When this acts on just the Y plus block, this is uh, A inverse Y plus B. And so since A and B are just any invertible matrices that you want, um, that's why you can just send this to, to some form um, like we had before here, where R is just the rank of Y plus, right? So if you know what the rank of Y plus is, then you can send it to something that looks like this because you're, you have this, this action on the left and right uh, by these invertible matrices. So you can just perform Gaussian elimination on, on the columns and rows. Okay, and so then once we do that, the question is, I would like to work on Y minus now, but I need to centralize. Um, I would like to also centralize this so I can keep this fixed. Um, and so 
you can just work out what the centralizing conditions are for A and B. And it turns out that you need A to look like this. So it needs to have a zero in this block. Everything else can be free. And then for B, it needs the same first block as A. And it has this sort of symmetry where instead it's, it's upper right block needs to be zero. It's lower left can be anything and it's last block can be anything. So it turns out that's what you need to centralize this Y plus up here. Okay, and then we just looked at what happens next and kept, kept going. So um, I'll just skip over this. Just here's the not so nice formula we got here. Um, maybe the only comment I'll mention is it should be pretty quick to see why we got the Jordan form because now that upper block is this kind of conjugation and so we can send that block to the Jordan form. Um, so it goes to J. But the idea was, yeah, just to see what we could do at each block while centralizing all the previous ones. Okay, and just here's an example of what the orbit representatives look like. So for GL22 here, we end up with these uh, 10 representatives. Um, so of course you have the, the trivial one. And then you have this sort of interesting symmetry going on where here, this was like our, our IR. Um, and then this next one, this is IS, right? And the, and the framework we had set up at the beginning. But it's kind of interesting that you get these uh, this sort of symmetric uh, pairs happening here for most of them. Um, uh, it, it doesn't happen for, for every every representative, but this this is just the kind of thing that you do. Okay. Oh, one last thing that I wanted to mention is um, one other thing that's kind of interesting. Um, is this next to last block here? So, uh, so the last one we have a, a two by two IR, and so here this is our this is our J. So we have the not trivial Jordan block. Um, so th so that doesn't seem at first glance to really match up with what's happening over here with this previous one because this is IR. This is what we were calling C. This is what we were calling R. Um, but in fact, it's kind of interesting. You can show that you can conjugate this one to something that looks like this. And then it kind of looks like it pairs up with that last one. So that, that's an interesting observation that I, I don't have a concrete answer for why that's happening. Oh, maybe you want to mention my um yeah so so I, I guess i kind of skimmed over this because we didn't talk about it in the proof uh let me let me go back up just to here to have some space so dr nakana was asking uh could, could we say what the irreducible components sort of look like for the for some of these simple examples so um so remember, n is this is this zero locus, um, and so it has a corresponding ideal. Oops. So its corresponding ideal is uh, generated um, by these trace polynomials. Uh, I guess I'm using Y, so maybe let me be consistent. So you look at, at uh, products where you take the product of the two odd blocks, and then you look at powers of that and take the trace, and this ranges from K is one up to the minimum of M and N. And so this was worked out by, uh, by Fuchs. I forget the year, but it's, uh, it's, it's not recent, um, but th this was worked out uh, by, by Fuchs. And um, so what we can see is like for GL11 even, if 
you're looking at elements in N here, and you're having something where you just have a single entry here. And so if this is an N, that means that you need uh, the trace of this product to be uh, to be zero, right? So you need precisely one of these to be zero. So this means that y plus equals zero or y minus equals zero. And so then in that case, we can see we have two irreducible components, one that corresponds um, to, to either y plus being zero or y minus being zero. So that's that's already kind of interesting because um, uh, what in the ordinary case n itself is irreducible, right? So for ordinary Lie algebras, the nilpotent cone is irreducible. Here you have at least two irreducible components in this simple example. And so I'm, I'm not sure if that is going to be true in general, if it's like because you have this sort of two copies happening, there's going to be two irreducible components. But um, yeah, it's already, it's already nice to see that there's something you have in here. And now I'm trying to figure out why I've lost control. Um, I don't remember. Oh no. We're having technical difficulties here. I don't know why it's trying to do this. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's happening over here. Okay. Now we're back. Got a glitch in the matrix. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll. I might be a little bit brief here with the end since I'm running short on time, but I just I want to at least mention um, mention these results. So, uh, so first off, from from what we did for GLMN, getting finitely many orbits, we were then able to extend that to any of our simple classical um, least super algebras. And so the way that we did that is we used this theorem here, which is a, a generalization. of Richardson's theorem. Um, which which was used uh, as yet another way to prove the finiteness of orbits for for the ordinary no button cone. So what we need is um, we we basically think about um, producing this complement here. So the setup is we take G0 to be a closed subgroup of one of our GLM cross GLNs and then we have our least super algebra G that we're interested in and its corresponding algebraic group for G0. And we would like this condition here to hold, which basically says that we can produce a complement that is uh, stable under the G act. Right, so when I say it's a complement, I just mean as a vector space complement, although in this case, since we're in, in uh, looking at super algebras, this is really a super vector space complement but I'll just say complement here. So I just mean it needs to respect the gradient also. Um, and then it needs to be stable under the bracket. So if you have that condition, then you can show that if you intersect the Lie algebra G that you're interested in, if you take um, any of its, uh, if, you, if you take a GLM cross GLN orbit in GLMN and intersect it down with G, you get a finite union of the G0 orbits, okay? And then since, since we already have finitely many orbits here, then you'll get finiteness in general. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna say about that? So, so we were able to do that for classical simples. Um, 
And the way that this kind of worked is we could show that if I take um, the nil potent cone for G, this is actually equal to the nil potent cone for G prime, where here G prime is some GLMN. Um, it's actually the nil potent cone there, and it just intersected with G1 for the Lie algebra you're interested in. So here G, G equals uh, G0, G1. This is a simple classical. Super so for all the ones in the list, except for the exceptionals, um, you can just uh, use the use the embedding. You can show in this previous this previous slide here. Um, you can just use this theorem because you, you could actually produce this M. Um, and I should say that to actually produce this M, we had to uh, we did this directly. Um, and this is different than in the ordinary Lie algebra case, you're able to use complete reducibility to actually get this for free for the uh, simples there, the non-exceptional uh, simples. But we actually had to construct it directly. Um, but in any case, once we had that and we showed this fact here, then we were able to conclude we had finitely many G0 orbits by that analog of Richardson's theorem. Um, and then for the exceptionals, we, we kind of work case by case. So this is for non-exceptionals, we did this. Okay, so just in the last couple of minutes here, let me mention um, how this connects up with this commuting variety. Um, so the commuting variety is this guy right here. So it's a collection of odd elements that bracket with themselves to be zero. Um, and so, uh, first off, notice that this is always trivial if you're in the ordinary Lie algebra case, right? You bracket anything with itself at zero. But in our cases where we're using specifically um, the super commutator, this is actually 2x squared, okay? So you can get some non-trivial uh, non things happening here. Uh, so, so like I said earlier, this was defined by Duflo and Serganova back in 2005, and they were using it um, uh, as a stepping stone to define these associated varieties um, for some finite dimensional Lie super algebra modules. Um, but they, along the way, they looked at sort of the, the structure of, of X and they were able to show under some suitable conditions um, when it has finitely many G0 orbits. Uh, so first off, I just mentioned here, it is G0 invariant, it's a sub-variety of G1. Um, and then under suitable conditions, which I've listed out here, uh, it needs to be contragradient with an N-decomposable Carton matrix, um, which just means it's one of the following on this list. And these cases, they were able to show there were finitely many G0 orbits on X. Um, and so I just wanted to mention very briefly how they did that. Um, I won't say too much, but I just want to emphasize that it's pretty different than what we did. So they, they looked at the root system structure um, and looked at some special collections of uh, roots. And uh, that's what this S is here. So they looked at a special collection of uh, mutually orthogonal, linearly independent isotropic odd roots. Um, and they were able to show that they have a bijection I don't know how much I want to say about this. Um, so did I actually actually write any more about this now? So let me just say very very briefly how this works. So um, what they did is they defined uh, a map. Let me not call it G. That would be confusing. Let me call it G, but lowercase. Um, so they define a map from this collection S to uh, their collection of orbits on the commuting variety. And the way that they did that is they send, um, they send a, a subset A over here to uh, an orbit G0 on X where the way they define this is if A 
is a collection of say k of these roots, then you can go over and choose in your root space decomposition. Um, you can choose some root vectors, some x x i's and uh, oops and g alpha i. And then they set x to be the sum of these. And, and so then that's, that's what this g zero dot x over here is. Right? So they send it to this. And then what they show is the induced map where you let the, the wild group act on s in like the obvious way, right? Because it's a collection of roots. So you just use the wild group action. Um, they showed that the induced map v bar of S modulo this wild group action to X modulo zero was a, a bijection. And they did it, uh, they did it case by case for all of the least super algebras in that list from earlier. Okay, so very different than how we, we got around to showing finiteness and arguments. Okay, so last, last little bit here. Um, so what are the connections between their variety and ours? Well, we were able to show that under these embedding conditions that we had from earlier. Um, so if we can embed our least super algebra into some GLMN and we have this complement condition, then in that case, um, we're able to show that their variety is actually contained in ours. And so these conditions are satisfied when we have a classical symbol. So these are satisfied for, for the non-exceptional case. So we were able to get that for free. And then uh, since, since we showed, you know, there were finite many uh, G0 orbits for N and X is contained in here, we actually showed that X is finite many G0 orbits. And this is uh, for, for more Lee super algebras than in their list, right? So we were able to do it for all classical samples, not for that, that special collection. Okay. Um, and I think since I'm about out of time, I think I'll stop there. Are there any questions from the audience at home? Yes, I have a question. So just uh -huh. to clarify, your your result at the end um, includes the strange Lucifer algebras that uh, Duflo and Sarganova didn't have, correct? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? I couldn't quite hear you. Your result for the finiteness of these orbits on X includes um, type P and type Q that they didn't have. That, that's right, yeah, the, there was there were several that were in that list, um, like you said, types P and types Q. Um, and I, I forget exactly what the reason is, but in, in their paper even, they mentioned, I think for like type Q, Q1, that um, they they couldn't show the finiteness of orbits uh, in this method, they used something else. I forget exactly how that goes. But right, that's, that's sort of what I meant when I said at the beginning that, um, that what we did here with this end sort of generalized and extended what they have because um, like you're saying, we we now have finiteness for more um, for more types. Andy, I have a question. Sure. Um, so you give representatives for the orbits Do, is have you thought at all about like just a parameterization in terms of, you know, a nice set <laughs> that maybe mm -hmm. we would. Yes, that's uh, that is one of the things on the on the list on the to do list. Ah, that's an honor to do list. So yes. so even for like a small example, you don't have a, a guess. Um, well, it, I was we were. I was starting to develop a guess until I noticed that 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 pairing that was happening 
doesn't always have. So if I go back up here to this example, I was mentioning all these that sort of came together in pairs. But there's this one weird one here that actually doesn't come in, in a pair. Um, all the others, besides, besides the trivial orbit, uh, but all the others seem to pair off. But, but this one doesn't, and it's almost, it's sort of, it, you can almost expect it when you look at it because it's sort of self-symmetric, unlike all the others, right? Like if you compare, if you compare these two, right, you can see that, that they're symmetric to each other, but this one is, is already self-symmetric. So I'm not sure how that's going to affect actually getting a parameterization. It may, it may turn out that on um, using these parameters here, it may turn out that they're not the ideal way to get um, a nice parameterization. You may have to do something else. I see, that makes sense. Or maybe your original strategy is working and you just need to allow for some representatives to be paired with themselves. But I don't know what the criterion for that would be, but that sounds yeah. very interesting. And I'm not even sure if this is the, the nicest way to write out the representatives, um, uh, even with what we did, because I, I, you know, I noticed after after we had completed the proof, when I was looking at examples again for, for some of the stuff I'm working on now, that was when I noticed this. Maybe I should have seen this earlier, but um, you know, at, at first glance, this doesn't seem to be uh, related to the guy next to it over here. But um, in some of what I was doing, I noticed that actually you could conjugate and get something that does start to form or where it shows the symmetry better. So I don't know if there's a better way to write out the representatives where that will be obvious. Okay, thanks. Another uh, question, have you computed the component groups for any small cases? Have I computed the what, I'm sorry? The component groups? No. Okay. No, I haven't. So that's much further down the down the list, I guess. So, so I think that uh, um, so Dr. Nakano wants to know if we're if if I or we will be able to compute the structure of the, the centralizer. Um, <laughs> so so the the answer is is yes, I think so, because um I, I skimmed over some of the details here, but you know, I, I mentioned that along the way in the proof, we kept track of the centralizing conditions at the steps. So if we can work out, um, if we can put them all together, basically intersect all of the centralizing conditions together in some meaningful way, we should be able to. And um, was what I've been working on recently for some of the small cases up to like GL3.3, um, we've actually worked out what the dimensions of the orbits and hence what the dimensions and structure of the centralizers are along the way. But uh, haven't gotten a general answer yet. So, um, Dr. Graham was asking, is there some sort of analog of the Springer resolution for this? And uh, the answer is, I would like to find one. That's another thing that's on the on the to do list. Um, but as of right now, I, I'm not sure. Yes, and I have a very nice picture for GL22 that's it's on my computer at home. <laughs> so, oh, so Arik asked, what about the orbit closure relations? And so uh, maybe let me scroll all the way down to the bottom. So just to sketch what we have. So, um, in GL22, we've, we've sort of noticed at the moment, there's something interesting happening where uh, if you put you can put the zero orbit at the bottom and then we had all those pairs. And so you can sort of build off these different pairs and they should somehow be on the same level of the orbit closure diagram. Um, and what's interesting is that guy that I said was self-dual, um, he seems to fit in the middle. So I don't know what I should call him, maybe even a tilde, right? 
but uh, yeah, so you can sort of keep building all the pairs together. And then what's nice is um, there's what appears to be a candidate for the regular orbit at the top, but there's two. So you end up at the top up here, maybe I'll just call this like OR and OR prime. And so, yeah, we have some guesses for what those candidates should be. So maybe like in GL22, um, the regular orbit representatives would be those last two that I listed. So it's, it's the, the ones where you have the full identity matrix up here, and then you take the largest possible Jordan block. And then the, the one that's sort of symmetric to it. So. Okay, maybe you can ask again. Are there any final questions from home? Okay, that's the case. So let's thank Andy again. Thank you, Andy. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, okay, so do I need to do that here? Do I hit stop? Thank you.